We got seven different stories from seven different media outlets, you guys. It's time for another episode of Regan's News Round. Let's go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Regan Elite here with another episode of Regan's News Round where I look at seven different news stories from seven different articles, all in one video, roughly about an hour, sometimes longer. And our first story we start with is from The Guardian with the headline that the Rwanda bill is likely to be stalled to at least until April after the seven defeats in the Lords. The peers voted for numerous amendments, making it improbable for the legislation will return to the Commons at this side of Easter. Guys, just so you're aware, the time of this recording of this uh, video, just for reference, is the 21st of uh, March 2024 at around 9, p 9 a.m. So obviously some of these stories may have updated or changed since then, just for reference. <clears throat> so, uh, the Rwanda bill. Um, obviously, we were expecting we were expecting the them to turn down the amendments. We were expecting it to be defeated in the House of Lords because it's not something, and I, I stress this on the Snowflake Watch on the live stream, and I'm going to stress this here, is that the Rwanda bill is not going to make a difference when it comes to immigration. It's a complete waste of time. It's a complete waste of taxpayer money, and it's just not, not there's no benefit to it whatsoever. Um, it's just a complete and total waste of time. It is a complete and total waste of time. It's distracting, uh, it's just nothing more than a distraction from many other issues this is not going to stop uh migrants coming to the uk it, they're still going to take they're still going to try and cross cross on the boats they're still going to try and, and huddle away on trucks and lorries to cross over into the uk so they're still going to try and do all these things so uh, and the, the purpose of the one bills to try and act like a deterrent well as it's as i have said on the live stream and i'll say it here again guys um migrants don't care they, uh, if they want to come to the UK, they will try to come to the UK. Um, some would like to come legally, but the problem is there is no legal routes to come to the UK unless you are from Hong Kong, unless you are from Ukraine. There is no legal route for them to come to the UK. We don't have a legal route, uh, which is why they choose to end up going from via via crossing the boats or uh, via hiding lorries, because we don't give because we for some for whatever reason don't want to give them a safe safe and legal route to do so. Now, there's no question that uh, migration has increased uh, within the last year or two. Um, however, <clears throat> there were many periods within the last uh, several years before that is that we had one of the lowest migration intakes within the Europe. We had one of the lowest in, in Europe. It has gone up uh, gone up to roughly around about mid-table in terms of numbers. Um, it has increased, obviously, it has uh, increased since then. So, obviously, you know, leaving the EU has definitely made uh, immigration better for us. Yeah, thanks, thanks Brexit, but um, th this is not going to stop them coming. And yes, you're going to ship some people off to Rwanda. Um, do you really think they're going to stay there? Do you really think that Rwanda is going to treat them and look after them? And you're, probably some of you will respond to this, I don't care, it's not more a problem. Um, which is uh, the, the selfish argument, obviously. Um, <clears throat> It's not going to make a difference, guys. It's not. So, hope... And, and let's not forget this, okay? This is really, really important. This was never in the Conservative 2019 manifesto as well. So, it's not a, it's not something that we, the public, have voted for either. So, Rishi Sunak's flagship Rwanda deportation bill is expected to put on hold until at least next month after the House of Lords inflicted seven defeats on Wednesday. The Safety of Rwanda Asylum and Immigration Bill, which aims to block Strasbourg from halting and the removal of asylum seekers to East Africa, is not expected to return to the Commons until after the Easter break. Any delay could make it increasingly difficult to fulfil the Prime Minister's plans to see flights take off by Kigali, uh, before Kigali by the spring. The legislation is central to the Conservative government's pledge to stop the boats. Ministers have claimed that the bill will deter people from travelling across the channel. Excuse me. No, it won't. We've, we've said this. It's not going to stop them. Just don't, don't take, don't take him seriously when he says that. Uh, they're just, they're, they're just talking cuckoo. They really are. In the wake of the defeats, the Labour peer uh, Shami Chakrabarti said, uh, given that the Prime Minister has bet the House on this post-truth bill, and and he has po he has literally betted on it. He bet a thousand pounds with uh, Piers Morgan that he would get flights off as well. 
he, he betted on it. He shook on it. So uh, never forget that as well. I know it's a silly bet, but still. <sighs> these further law defeats have left these credibility even more deluded. Arguments about the international and domestic rule of law hit home, and home is where many Conservative peers seem to have stayed. Peers voted 271 to 228, majority 43, to press their demands that they legislation has due regard for domestic and via international for domestic and international laws. They back an amendment by 235 to 230 votes that states Rwanda is only deemed to be safe for as long as the provision of the UK's treaty are in place. And a link amendment regarding the monitoring of Rwanda safety also voted through. <sighs> it's been recognised as not a safe country. Um, and if it was a safe country, as they claim in they are, why are we taking refugees from Rwanda as well? Let's not forget that. And I've, I've covered the story about us taking Rwandan refugees in as well, which is insane. In, it's just insane. Peers voted 276 to 226 in favour of the crossbench peer David Hope's amendment, which lays out how it's to be decided whether the provisions of the Rwanda Treaty are enforced. Another member by Lady uh, Chakrabarti that removes a key clause declaring Rwanda a safe country in decision of individual asylum claims was voted through by a majority of 30. The government suffered another defeat when its peers backed uh, change to its Rwanda bill regarding the age assessment of unaccompanied children. The bill came back to the Lords after MPs on Monday voted down 10 amendments to the draft law proposal by peers earlier this month. It has to be passed to uh, activate the deal that would allow the UK to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. It has so far cost the taxpayers up to £600 million and has been signed off by three Conservative Prime Ministers since 2022. We have wasted £600 million, £600 million on something that will not work, guys. On a, on a taxpayer base, excuse me, but £600 million of taxpayer money on a, on a, on a bill that we don't even do what it's supposed to do. They're supposed to act as a, as a deterrent, and it's not going to work. We've wasted £600 million. Pounds. And there's actually been one or two reports I've seen that perhaps the mon the number isn't isn't, isn't, isn't even the, the full cost. It's, it's, it's going to be more. It's, it's gonna, it could rise even more. If this passes a billion, it'll be a an an national embarrassment. It's, it's literally like throwing away. It's no different than throwing away that £37 billion pounds of ta ta test and trace that we've thrown away as well. That, that's just how ridiculous this is, guys. The bill must return to the Commons in a process known as ping pong, where it is battled between the two parliamentary chambers and uh, parliamentary chambers until it can be agreed uh, the final wording. Labour suggested it will not seek to block the bill completely. Why? Why would they not block the bill completely? It's, it's, why would they not block the bill completely? They should do. This is not what the people want. <coughs> Before the bill returned to the Lords, an illegal immigration, the illegal immigration minister, why don't, what, what a stupid name, uh, Michael Thomason described the proposals put forward by peers as a wrecking amendment. Another vote is expected to wait until uh, MPs return from their Easter break on the 15th of April. Sources said the government will not clear the common schedule to allow votes next week. And number 10's official ins ins insists that even if the legislation is not passed until after the Easter, the goal of the first deportation taking place this spring could still be met. Uh, how how are you supposed to do that if you haven't? I'm a bit surprised how you're going to be able to do that exactly. Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary, said that the Rwanda scheme is a, f a failing farce, which will only cover less than one percent of the asylum arrivals. It is clearer than ever that Rishi Sunak knows that his plan that this plan won't work, and only seems as a political gimmick to get whatever former immigration minister described as symbolic flights just off before an election. If the Conservatives were ready to implement this, they would be bringing the bill back to complete the remaining stages next week and get on with it, she said. But because their plans aren't ready, they decide to delay the bill as well, so they can try to blame everyone else for the chaos they have created. Yes. As well as suffering defeats in the laws, Sunak is under pressure from the right of his party at, after the Home Office said it would pay some asylum seekers thousands of pounds to move to Kigali. See, wasn't making it up. James Clevy, the Home Secretary, said, I am pushing in, in Parliament for a deterrent scheme supported by the ones that will not uh, only help stop the boats but provide safe destination for those who are in the UK illegally and that's why we need the bill through. Uh, While Labour and their allies try anything to delay, disrupt or destroy the plan, people are risking the likes their lives in the hands of people who don't care if they die as long as they pay. The talking needs to end and we need to get on with the job of saving lives and stopping the boats. And it's the 
and let's not forget as well it's really important to emphasize as well is that coming up in the summer as well there's a little thing called the you're really yawning today i don't know what it is it's that early morning um we have the olympics happening in france as well so there's going to be even less enforcement from the french side when it comes when that when that uh when the when the buzz around that and the and the show around that kicks off as well because you know they're, they're going to be prioritizing yes even though the uk are throwing money at the french um you know the, F the french want to make sure they have a perfect olympic game so they're not going to they, they, there's going to be less security on on calais side without a shadow of a doubt for me I, I fully expect it to i fully expect it to guys so the next one we got, guys, is an exclusive from Sky News here. <clears throat> so Montgomery attacks the predatory BBC over the local news provision. The executive chairman of the National World will launch a renewed broadside against the corporation over its presence in Britain's digital new market, Sky News Learns. So this will up... Um, he's having the speech today on Thursday, so it's likely by the time um, we talk about this, some of you may have already heard the speech already. Um, but uh, let me just share a couple of thoughts um, uh, before we read into this. So obviously, I have understandably so many people are very sceptical. And obviously, the BBC has, in in a way, lost its way uh, for quite a while now. And it's a real shame because um, when I was younger, I actually considered the BBC to be a very reliable broadcaster. Um, there's no doubt that uh, governments have had uh, too much of a hand in the, the BBC. I am hoping that uh, when Labour comes to power, if they come to power, that uh, that they will change the way that chairmans and uh, chairmans are appointed to the BBC, and there is less less influence uh, within government and more allowing it to be actually the state broadcaster it's supposed to be. And I hope, and I kind of hope they could do something about that with Scotland as well. But I guess they have to wait until independence up there before they can actually have their own independent uh, media up there, because it just seems a bit of a nonce that um, it's very union esque. Uh, the BBC Scotland, from the understanding that I have from people up there. So, I mean, it's the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, is still in a very important news uh, channel. It's still very important to people. It's still uh, many millions of people up and down across the whole UK still watch it, um, and those uh, and it still has a, a, a very important effect. And obviously, those who are on it and give their analysis and journalists and reporters on it, you know, their opinions do do get a higher higher threshold of attention whenever they speak because they work for the BBC. So that's an important factor into it. So yeah, so let's read a bit into this, guys. So. The newspaper veteran David Montgomery will, on Thursday, that's today, revive his long-held criticism of the BBC's encroachment into local news provisions when he accused it of predatory behaviour which harms commercial rivals. Sky News has learned that Mr Montgomery will use his foreword to the annual results announcement of National World, the London list company he runs, to launch a scathing attack on the corporation. Mr Montgomery, whose company owns the title The Scotsman and the Yorkshire Post, has been staunch critic of the BBC's presence in online news, saying that in 2019 that his remit needed to be redefined. So this is someone who basically wants to, doesn't, you know, if it was up to him, he'd rip the, he would uh, tear down the BBC. But I'm strongly against that. Uh, I just think it, it does, the BBC does need reforms. Um, I think they should seriously consider turning it into a subscription fee instead of the online TV license. I think that needs to end. I generally do. That needs to end. That everyone is forced to pay for a BBC license when not everybody watches the BBC. That needs to change. That really, really does need to change. Um, and I, I, I have no doubt that the BBC needs reform, especially on the political side, because I don't think they give their media coverage fair enough, uh, both uh, here and in other places. But um, I certainly am not in favour any way, shape or form of, of getting rid of the BBC outright. I think that would be a terrible idea. I think the BBC is far too loved, far too cherished. And I, I, I actually think, yeah, it can be saved in, in a way. I think it, it just needs to be adapted to get with the times. And it needs to be more uh, more neutral when it comes to talking of news and politics. Um, because that's one thing it is not at the moment. On Thursday, he will say that the national world has been at the forefront of the campaign against predatory behaviour at the BBC, which uses taxpayer funds to complete online threatening local independent journalism. Where is his source for this, by the way? 
It is remarkable that BBC financed by compulsory tax is permitted to enforce its monopoly in the news uh, sector months after months. He will add news remarks which have been obtained by Sky News. In January 2024, 3.1 billion page views for BBC News dwarfed the combined uh, total of the UK's 28 leading independent news sites, including the Mail, Online, The Sun, of course, National World. In no other sectors would such an unfair market be tolerated by regulators. Well, um, at the end of the day, is it not people's choices who they want to read from? I mean... I mean, I, do, I use the BBC. I don't always use it, but I use it, just like I use other media outlets. So um, it's it's because it's still popular. By by, I, I would say if 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 this number if this number is true, is what they're saying. Um, that tells you that people still rely on the BBC in terms of news media news coverage. So mm, I'm just gonna put that out there. Mr. Moragri has been pushing for a news media association uh, industry body to take more bus, robust position against the BBC. Sky News is among the commercially owned channels which uh, competes with the BBC in the provision of news across different media platforms. National World, which has a market value of £38 million, was among the prosperous bidders of the Daily Telegraph, holding talks with financial backers before an ill-fated deal was struck with the Abu Dhabi investment fund vehicle Redbird IMI. Mr. Mahogany wants the company to transition from being a media business with specific expenses in news journalism to becoming a broader content provider across media platforms. The BBC has also faced uh, further criticism this week uh, from commercial groups over its plans to broadcast advertising as part of its radio content. Um, yeah, I can understand the criticism there. I, I can understand the criticism there. On Wednesday, Tim Davey, the BBC's uh, Director General, was asked about the organisation's new strategy, rebutting the suggestion that the corporation was responsible for the declining commercial provision of local news. N I, I don't accept that. I think it's a, you know... <sighs> How can I put this? You know, media is changing. People are not always looking at the same... You know, gener as generations come, less and less people are relying on the TV when it comes, and it's all been done on their mobile phones now. It's all been done on this, guys. This is where your your you you look at most of your information. Most people don't do it through a computer or lap or some laptops. A lot of people do it through their mobile device now. That's become their source of information, and not obviously in certain apps here you'll choose to look, watch media through. And uh, you know we. People don't have time to watch every single or look at every single uh, uh, newspaper or uh, media outlet. It's a massive competition out there. Excuse me, I do apologise for consistently yawning. I'm really sorry. And it's uh, it's 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 that it's it's competition. It's marketing. It, you know, I I like I just think like <clears throat> to me it's like you know I I don't think the the in my opinion, I do think there needs to be reforms in the BBC, but should, do I think it needs to be like completely broken down and and, and that? No, I don't think so. Right, that, that's just my personal opinion. But some of you may vehemently disagree because of maybe of how it's, it's historically covered certain certain uh, certain news is out there, or devolved nations, shall we say as well. I could also understand that as well. So on Wednesday, Tim Davey, the BBC General Director, was asked about the organisation's new strategy. Oh, sorry, I've read that already. Apologies. I think some of these things are structural. So if you look at the decline of local print, you look at uh, the trends uh, lies there. He told the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, so I think it is not the BBC causing the issue. And actually, if you look at the amount of journalism we're producing, it's often very, very different or in a very different level of coverage to others in the market. Like, they, they still have a fairly decent... Um, uh, I, I'm, I I sometimes look at them for um, world news as well, um, as well every now and then. They don't always, um, and they they still have like still uh, in my opinion decent new some decent news out there to say the least. So I wouldn't say it's <clears throat> I wouldn't say it's the end of the world. Um, I like, but I do believe there needs to be reforms to it. I don't believe the BBC should be scrapped in any way, shape, or form. It does need to be restructured. Um, I am not in favour in any way, shape, or form of privatising the British Broadcasting Corporation. Absolutely not. I'm definitely not. No, it must, in my opinion, must remain state broadcast. I think it's, it's uh, maybe in ten years' time or something. Maybe we can have that discussion, but not right now. I think it's it's still very much very loved, very well looked after, and people care. People take that six o'clock 
still lots of people around the country, all over the UK, uh, like to sit and watch the six o'clock BBC news because they do uh, find it interesting to see that what they what's going on in the world today. So I still think that's really important. But I also provide my own news here on this channel, which is why you guys are probably watching this. So if you can, guys, yeah, and help support the work that I do here, please hit the like button, be greatly appreciated, and share this across social media, and hit that bell notification icon, so be notified when I upload another video. And if it doesn't work, turn it off and turn it back on. It, it, normally it's a it's a YouTube issue, it's not a YouTuber issue, and it, you might have that issue with me when it comes to whenever my videos are read, are highlighted, or live streams that whenever I go live or that, that can either be, it's not just me, it can be any other YouTuber. So if you ever wonder why sometimes a content has gone out and you're not notified of it because of the notification thing is not working, so you turn it off, turn it back on, and that usually fixes the problem for you guys. Um, so just on a reference there. Speaking of the BBC, we have one from them. You didn't think I was going to leave them out, did you? So the headline is UK rent prices are up 9% in record yearly rise, says the uh, ONS. So as always, rents are continuing to rise, which means that uh, thanks to, uh, well, not just the, the quasi quartang budget, we you know, it's just the cost of living is adding on to this. The, it's not just that the housing situation, it's not just the rental market, that's just this. There's also, you have to tie into the bills, uh, council tax bills, uh, the council tax bills and you have to count in the water and electricity that accounts here yeah, for these homes as well so all these things are mitigating it on top of the issues that are taking place with regards to rent we still have the issue of landlords still being able to evict people at short notice as well <coughs> i mean so and the conservatives are not doing anything with regards to that um obviously because some of them are landlords let's not forget that i think that's very very important to highlight as well um but if, if it's already a struggle for people to make to buy a home these days like my generation are you know you, you'd be dead lucky to have a home and, and you'd be just be you know sh scrambling working sl slaving literally just to try and pay off pay off you pay off uh, pay off your bills in that nowadays it's, it's it's absolutely insane but even on the rental market like you, you can be paying like the the, the, the differences of, of when I used to rent compared to now is, you know, several hundred pounds difference. And it's quite shocking. And that's not even including energy, water and council taxes, which are all, are all going up in the same way as well. So it's just absolutely bonkers. The, the, the cost, it, the costs it takes to literally live in the place now. So the average cost of rent uh, in the UK rose by 9% in the 12 months to February this year. The highest annual increase since record began in 2015. These were price rises in all parts of the country, according to the Office of National Statistics, the ONS. In England, London renters saw costs go up uh, the most at 10.6%, taking an average uh, rent, monthly rent in the capital to £2,035. The government spokesperson said its renters reform bill would give tenants, a landlords, and landlords a fair deal. Funny how it hasn't gone through yet. Hmm, funny that. The average monthly rent increase across uh, the UK ranged from 8.8% in England through to 10.9% in Scotland and 9% in Wales. This means tenants in each country paid an extra £104,000, uh, £93 or £60 a month respectively. Where, where you know, Unless you are like literally a CEO, where, where are you going to find the money for that? Like, it's, like you really have to, you know, the money is just, yeah. It's just way too high. It's way too high. Northern Ireland's data lags behind the rest of the UK, with figures currently avail available up to the end of the year. The ONS reported a 9.3% increase in the country for the year to December 2023. London, which saw the biggest increase overall, had the highest rent uh, even before the latest inflation figures were published on Wednesday. In England, outside the capital, British Stall was the most expensive place to rent privately, costing £1,734 a month. £1,700. Oh, that's just who has that? That and that and that. That's just rent, by the way. That's just rent. Yeah, and you're not even taking into account the rest of the bills and any additional bills that you would have on top as well. You know, so you have your base, you have your council tax, you have your water, you have your energy, you have all them. You still pay on top of this. So you got all that. Oh, by the way, don't you want broadband? Well, that's going to cost you about something about every month as well. Oh, by the way, um, your phone, uh, char charges are you'll be paying a, a bill every month yeah, for your phone as well. 
and that's uh, and that, and if you have any other entertainment sources, they're going to be chatting, adding on top. Like where where is uh and then there's and there's obviously your basic essential needs like food and and food and essentials and all that, and then you find you've got oh you're in the negative, so you're going to have to cut back on something. Oh, I'm not going to be able to save any money now. Oh, I'm going to have to dip my hand into my pocket in order to keep going. It's just yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a lost generation, as some people have said. Meanwhile, the average UK house price fell by 0.6% in the year to January, although it marked a slower uh, drop than the 2.2% annual fall uh, record a month earlier. Rent prices have gradually increased across the UK since the RNS began collecting data for the whole of the UK in 2015, but have spiked since 2022. Research publicly published... Uh, by data along uh, the website Statistica suggested landlords were up in the prices due to increasing costs running a rental property. There is no, like I've said, there is obviously other other costs uh, to a property have, have contributed to landlords increasing their prices. But there are also many landlords who are bumping it up in the means of trying to basically rip, rip the tenants for as much money as they possibly can. And there are those out there. It's important to highlight that. I'm not saying all landlords are like that, um, but there are those landlords out there. But that was not only the only reason. A survey of almost 1,000 landlords carried out towards the end of last year. More than half, 59%, said they were trying to align with local market rents. Ben Badal, the National Residential Landlords Association, blamed the chronic shortage of properties to meet demands for rents being hiked up. The Chancellor needs to develop growth tax measures to ensure a healthy supply of quality homes to rest to rent, he said, pointing to advice from leading economic research group, the Institutional of Physical Studies, that more harshly landlords are taxed, higher rents will be. Spokesperson for the Department of Leveling Up, Housing and Communities said it recognised the cost of living pressures tenants are facing and our landmark renters reform bill offers a new, fairer deal for tenants and landlords. The most recent data shows the size of the private rental sector has doubled since 2004, peaking in 2016 and has remained roughly stable since, they added. A part of the renters reform bill first introduced uh, last May was to ban the no-fault evictions by the general election. The bill has not passed through the House of Commons and last month the BBC saw draft amendments which suggested ministers were consulting backbench Tory MPs on watering down plans protections for renters in England. At the time, the government insisted the bill would abolish Section 21 evictions, the official name for no-fault evictions, giving people more security in their homes and empowering them to challenge poor practices. And then still, we still haven't put that through. <coughs> Jill, a 63-year-old renter from Surrey, told the BBC she has been issued with a multiple Section 21 notices by her landlord. The most recent telling her she had to vacate where she lives by the end of April. Having pushed back and sought advice from various housing associations, Jill said her landlord finally admitted it was because he could get uh, £300 more than what I was paying. Sadly, I can't pay him anymore at the moment because I'm not working, Jill said adding she could barely afford the rent when she was in a job due to the rising costs. Jill was diagnosed with cancer earlier this year and been signed off work to receive medical treatment, including a six-month course of chemotherapy due to start on the Thursday. I wish her all the best in all seriousness. You hear horror stories about people turning away uh, where they live to find their belongings in, in bin bags outside. I just pray it doesn't happen to me, she said. Responding to the latest rent figures, housing charity shelter chief executive Polly Nisa said the private renting had reached a boiling point. Decades of failure to build genuine affordable social homes has made private renting the only option for many. <clears throat> As a result, competition for overpriced and often shoddy rentals is uh, fierce, she said. Miss Needles said this meant landlords were free to hike up rents safe in the knowledge that, that if their tenants can't pay, they can issue a no fault eviction within just two months' notice and get a new tenant at a higher rent. Higher rent. To help struggling families keep off their homes, the government must uh, keep its promise to rent arrears to pass watertight renters reform bill to ban the no fault evictions. She added, "Yeah, it's it's just um, <clears throat> it's insane how how they can get away with it. It really, really is. The majority of landlords are able to get away with this, and there's seemingly nothing nothing being done about it, guys. It's um, it's a major issue, and it just needs it needs this uh, evic the fault twenty one um." just needs to go it needs to go they need to get this this bill through and the conservatives are literally sitting on it they're literally sitting on it and i generally and i i do i actually do believe labor will if if it's going to be sitting there all the way until labor come into power i do believe they'll get it through 
at least I hope so anyway because um, uh, yeah pe people are desperate in desperate need some kind of safety net because there's there isn't one right now for people in there in desperate desperate need of it guys so guys one more thing before we go to the next article guys um, if you can financially support me in any way, shape, or form, if you're one of those obviously financially struggling, then please don't uh, give me your money. I'd rather you look after yourself first before giving any money away, uh, especially if you have a local charity or whatever that you support. Or if you, if you are one of those people, um, I really greatly appreciate that you give up your money yet to support them. However, if you want to financially support me in the work that I do here, it really does help make a difference when it comes to this. As of right now, I'm currently still looking for... A, looking for a part-time job however i do gain some revenue from youtube since i've started this work and you can support me in the work i do here for as little as 99p as a youtube member or on leveling up on a 2.99 membership both have interesting perks and benefits uh, for for themselves such as if you sign up for the 2.99 you'll get early access to my content that means once i've uh, made the content and uploaded it to YouTube. Once it passed its um, monetization, you can um, have uh, you can have that access to it before it becomes publicly available. And also other things such as custom emojis. And whenever you and as a YouTube uh, member, which you financially support me, whenever you comment on any of my videos, I respond. I will always respond to your comment. It can sometimes be a short or a long one, but them I always uh, respond to. And by the way, I do read every single comments on my channel. I don't always respond to all of them, but any members ones I always do respond to. So those uh, those perks there. And finally, just before, uh, finally, um, oh, you can also check out exclusive content on Rumble and Patreon as well. You don't have to pay for them, but you can check them out for additional content as well. It'd be greatly appreciated as well. So this next one here, guys, is exclusive from iNews. The post office box involved in the Horizon uh, conviction now managing compensation claims. So <clears throat> campaigners and MPs said the lettering Caroline Richards managing claims from sub-postmasters to the Horizon shortfall compensation scheme is outrageous. <sighs> Why did I have a feeling that there was something going to be wrong with regards to the, 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 this, 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 this scandal? Like just one problem after another here. Um, what what what's why are we? I want to make this clear and like this needs to be addressed and issued. And obviously, we I don't know like every single case. I don't know every single case might be, be every single case may be different. But still, there needs to be a fair compensation scheme given to those who have who have suffered tremendously at the hands of this. It has to be, has to be, it has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with, and it has to be done fairly. And it sounds like here that it's not being done properly. So yeah, this is a cause for concern. So let's read a bit into it, you guys. So a post office manager who played a key role in the wrongful convictions of sub postmasters during the Horizon scandal is now handling victims' compensation claims the eye can reveal. Campaigners and MPs said it is outrageous that Caroline Richards was given a new position in the post office high-rise and shortfall compensation scheme, given her previous links to the scandal. Kevin Jones, MP, who has campaigned on behalf of the Horizon uh, victims, said it shows the post office just doesn't get the sensitivity of these cases and called for the compensation process to be made completely independent. <sighs> Sorry, I just hit the mic there. What on God's green earth is wrong with this post office? You know, I really, you know, this, like many other things that we just decide to hand over to the private sector, <sighs> post office needs to come back in private, uh, state hands. It needs to come back in state hands. And they, they really, like, this is just, they don't care. They don't care. They want to do the bare minimum. And uh, obviously they have a, obviously they do care about certain Employees within their company and Caroline Lucas uh, Richards, sorry, Caroline Richards here is certainly one of them. And absolutely, like someone who was perhaps linked to the original scandal is actually dealing with their compensation schemes. Do you honestly believe that they're going to be fair? And the other thing as well here, as it's just highlighted here, is it, they, they're obviously it's exclusive from the eye. They're saying that this is even made completely independent. Why on earth is it not independent? Am I the only one going crazy here? How is this not independent? It's just insane to me. Absolutely insane. 
Miss Richards, who had worked for the post office for more than 30 years, was a business development manager. In 2009, she played a significant role in the wrongful prosecution of former sub-postmaster uh, Jacqueline McDonald. Miss McDonald, the mother of three, was convicted of stealing almost £100,000 from a branch in a village of Bromington, Lancashire, and was sentenced to 18 months in prison. According to a court report in the Lancashire Evening Post, Miss Richards instigated an investigation after discovering the amount of cash being held in Miss McDonald's safe did not match the amount she had declared in her account. Miss McDonald's conviction was overturned in 2021 and the case had been examined at the ongoing public inquiry led by Sir Wine Williams. In January, Sir Wine heard how Kate uh, Noble, an assistant at McDonald's, uh, Miss McDonald's branch wrote a letter of complaint to the Home Office describing the behaviour of Miss Richards and investigators Stephen Bradshaw as unprofessional and disgusting. Yeah, uh, of course it is. I don't really need to add any more to that. In the letter, she said, Mr. Bradshaw and Miss Richards came to my place of work and asked me if I wanted to make a statement. Uh, Miss Noble added, after a very confrontational five minutes and after Steve didn't get what he wanted, Steve told Caroline to close the post office. Mr Bradshaw, a former lead investigator who remains on the post office payroll, has been accused of acting like a mafia gangster when securing false convictions against sub-postmasters during evidence to the inquiry. Oh, okay. That's disgusting. That really is. The inquiry also heard evidence from former sub-postmaster Mohamed Siba, who said was interviewed by Miss Richards and investigator Michael Hayward after being suspected of stealing five grand due to the Horizon software at East Branch in West Yorkshire. He was suspended and his contract was later terminated. There is no suggestion Miss Richards knew the Horizon IT scandal was faulty at the time of the investigations. Since December 2021, Ms. Richards has been working as a senior dispute resolution manager on the Horizon shortfall scheme. The fund set up to compensate postmasters were not criminally convicted but lost money due to the faulty IT system. Ms. Richards is part of a small team which helps administer these claims with a job description for the role uh, stated it, uh, stating it includes ensuring all cases are investigated and renewed fairly and impartiality. Well, it certainly doesn't feel that way, does it? Uh, Peter Varenka, a former sub-postmaster who lost £16,000 his home and marriage during the Horizon scandal, spotted Mrs Richards' involvement in her Horizon investigations and believe her current role is, in a, is inappropriate. This person lost £16,000, lost his home and lost his and his marriage. That's, that's terrible. He told the eye, I was reading some transcripts from the inquiry and recognised her name. I've spoken to her on a phone via email a few times. My first thought is that there must be a different Caroline Richards. It couldn't be the same one. Who and I thought it was appropriate to put her in that position? Yeah. Clearly, people who don't care about this. Miss Varenka had been waiting almost two years for compensation and said the process had been painfully slow. Christopher Head, a former sub-postmaster and campaigner for Horizon Victims, said, It's impossible for someone like Caroline Richards to completely eradicate from her mind what happened with Jackie McDonald. It should be somebody completely independent who has no involvement in the Horizon scandal whatsoever. The Labour MP Kevin Jones told the idea appointment of Miss Richards to a job in the compensation scheme was outrageous. You couldn't make it up. It shows the post office just don't get it, especially the sensitivity of the case he added. It also reinforces my view that they need to be taken out of the compensation process. Yes, it absolutely does. Like, why are they still allowing it to be? I just don't know. It comes amid complaints of a culture and distrust work towards postmasters remain embedded in the post office. Earlier this year, the former chairman, Henry Sultan, wrote an email that two former postmasters on the board as non-executive directors, uh, Sadif Ishmael and Elliot Jacobs, felt, they were, felt there was a complete lack of respect for postmasters and that the culture was toxic. Under fire, Chief Executive Nick Reid had previously admitted that uh, the post office is investigating more than 40 cases of alleged inappropriate behaviour by existing employees relating to Horizon. Our uh, post uh, office spokesperson said claims that the Horizon shortfall scheme are assessed by an independent advisory plan of internal experts. So they're claiming that they are assessed by an internal advisory panel of internal experts. There is full governance process for each and every claim. Our sole aim is that every postmaster affected by the scandal receives full and fair uh, redress as swiftly as possible. Ms. Richards declined to comment. I don't blame her for not commenting, especially for her part in all this. And the fact that she's involved in the compensation scheme speaks a lot of volumes. It's absolutely infuriating, if I'm honest, actually, I'll, I'll say. Um, why? Why on earth 
is she involved in 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 this? I, I, I did that in this in the compensation. I don't know. Um, it's just just shocking, absolutely shocking. And um, I hope the processes get sorted a lot quicker. I generally do because these people have suffered for a very very long time. Um, it's not going to fix it, but it will give some comfort. And um, it just highlights just how little to no care that the post office really has for, 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 for people, you know. And this is this is what happens when you leave them in the hands of private companies. Certain employers don't give two hoots about about uh, about uh, anything else except the bottom line. And that's kind of the impression that I've now I feel yeah I like when we talk about it. So guys, we're going to take a little break, uh, break things up here on Regan's News Round. I normally put a funny video in in between. We've got three more articles to go through before we come to the end of this. So I hope you guys enjoy this one here. This one is from Foil and Arms. And the headline for it is, Why You Should Never Open Your Mail. Hope you guys enjoy this. Oh, you got a letter. Okay, we can put that in the bin for me, will you? Yeah. You want me to put it in the bin? You don't want to open it? You don't open mail these days. You put it straight in the bin. Why'd you put it straight in the bin? Because it's always asking you to do something. Yeah. Blah, 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 read this. Blah, 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 do that. Yeah, it's never like, hey, buddy, great job. Keep it the good work. Yeah, if they want us to read mail, they should make it more positive. Yeah. Yeah, that's not how it works. You kind of have to read your post. Why? Because it could be important. Important, important to who? The person yeah. sending it, maybe. <laughs> Damn. Give me a break. Well, this oh, one no. has final warning on it. So oh, final. Oh, oh I think it fell for it. Oh, no. That's not a final warning, man. It's just something that they put on the envelope to scare you into opening it. We only open very specific letters. Mm hmm. We've developed a system over time. It's foolproof. A yeah. system? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything marked to the householder? Bin. To the R occupier? Bin. To whom am I concerned? I'm not concerned. Bin. And anything with that creepy little plastic window goes straight in the bin. Why won't they let me see the rest of the letter? Because they're hiding something. Postcards used to be safe. Yes, sir. Your friend would send you one, you know, an address Dublin, Ireland, Europe, the world, the universe. Hilarious. Yeah. Now it's just from companies with that fake handwriting font, you know. Uh, that should be illegal. Yeah. Hi, friend. The sun is shining here in West Cork. Want to buy some solar panels? Oh, the rest is just junk mail. So I mean, at least we can agree that that goes in the bin. Whoa. What? No, uh, no, 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 junk no. mail. Dude, junk. Junk it's... mail never hurt anybody. Yeah. <laughs> junk mail never evicted anybody. Demanded money from. Them, tried to cut off their electricity. Junk mail is full of hope, honesty, and opportunity. Fifteen percent off spicy wings with any twenty-inch pizza. Yes, please. Opportunity. Want to get your garden landscaped, your windows cleaned? No, but thanks for asking, Junk Mail. Opportunity. Thinking about selling your house? Not right now, the market's a little saturated. You don't own a house. Yeah, but... Opportunity, opportunity. if you did have a house, it would be okay. the... One man's Junk Mail is another man's... Oh, the lights have gone. Ah, that's a final warning. <laughs> uh, Foil and Arms, guys. Make sure you check out their YouTube channel, uh, Foil and Arms. Coming in, they're 944,000 subscribers. They are very, very popular, guys. So definitely do check out their content. Go and watch watch their stuff. Give them a like and share and all that stuff, guys. It really does make a difference to them as it does to any other YouTubers that you enjoy their content. So please give props to them whenever you possibly can. So guys, the next one we have for you, I uh, have for you guys, is from the Independent. Now it says it's exclusive, but I've seen this in, uh, in other, other other areas, to be fair. Um, and it's for involving the Carrot Club, uh, the Garrett Club, which uh, I did cover on Monday's um, uh, Snowflake Viewpoint. Um, interesting to say the least here. So the headline here is the head of MI6 and the Cabinet Secretary have quit the private Garrett's Club over female members' row. So the exclusive. That's something ex ex exclusive. A number of members said to be considering leaving the, the private members club if it refuses to change its stance on keeping membership men only. Um, now, like I said on uh, the live stream, um, like I don't like the fact that this club has so much power, it has so much influence, it has so many members, and quite frankly, women just don't, aren't members. They're just, they're just not allowed to be members, even though that there have been cases of women being... Uh, invited to join join in on certain dinners and, and dines or whatnot but no actual women members um but like i said then like even if it allows women uh, into its club which it should do um i still feel like they have uh this club has too much influence 
I don't like it. I don't like I don't like having a club like this having so much influence. Never mind just the fact that it's a men's only club. I just think it's too dangerous. I really, really do. They have far too many far too many people uh, when it comes to in control of this. So um pleased that the head of MI six and the cabinet secretary has quit, but it's not really and I and I and if it does lead to an influx of people leaving, yeah, I, I'd rather more people leave it than join it, personally. Um, just because of the uh, the the people that they have in it, it's just yeah dangerous. So the head of MI6, Sir Richard Moore, and the cabinet secretary, Sir Simon Case, have resigned from their private Garrett Club amid ongoing controversy over its refusal to accept women as members. The Independent has learned. Now, let's be very clear. Do you honestly? Let's let's. I just want to ask the premier chat or ask them in the comments down below. Do you honestly think? That if this story hadn't been blown up on the on Monday by the Guardian, do you think that they would have left? It, because it's in the media now, it's in the spotlight. Do you honestly think, yeah, that they would have done this? Because I don't think they would. Just because it's out in the public now is, I think, what's what's, what's the reason why they're doing this. I don't think it's just a case of they wanting women in. I don't I don't accept that because I think if they if the majority of men in this club wanted women in this club, they would have done more to to do it. They I think they would have done more to do it if I'm generally honest. A number of other members, including senior public figures, are also said to be considering leaving the historic London club if it refuses to change its stance on keeping the members uh, membership men only. The club, based in the Garrick Street, was founded in 1831. It's one of its oldest members uh, members' clubs in the world. The high-profile departure of Sir Richard and Sir Simon following the publication of the Guardians of the club's membership lists, which include people from higher echelons of the political and judicial establishment, as well as the King. It is believed uh, Sir Richard has told the club last year he wanted to resign uh, because of his stance on women members. OK, so he's claiming that last year he wanted to resign. He was, however, persuaded to stay on after being told that a vote would be held on the issue, which has become increasingly contentious this year. So, what's the what's the what's the uh, reasons for not including women? Answer to our postcard, please. There has, however, been uncertainty about the timing of the vote, and also whether a demand by reformers for a change in voting procedure, allowing a simple majority to decide on the issue of women members rather than the current requirement of 66%, would take place. So Simon's resignation from the Garrett came on Wednesday, 24 hours after he defended. After he defended, he he's been a member of the club while appearing before a Commons committee. Yeah, uh, I saw the clip of that. That's not yeah, it's just pretty distasteful, wasn't it? Labour MP Liam Bryan asked Sir Simon whether he could foster a genuine culture of inclusiveness in the civil service while being a member of an all-male uh, club. He replied, I have to say my position on this one thing is clear. If you believe profoundly in reform of an institution, by and large, it's easy to do so if you, if you join in and make the change from within rather than chuck rocks from the outside. And by the way, maths is also a part of this. Every one person who leaves it, who is in favour of uh, flick, fixing this anti delusional position, every one of us who leaves means that these institutions don't change. And yet, somehow, he he's allegedly have left. I'm going to say allegedly because I, I, I they, they claim, they said, they, yeah. In the same city, in the Commons Chairman, Sir Bernard Jenkins uh, asked fellow uh, MP Sir Robert Bunkland, the former Justice Secretary, if he wanted to declare an interest as he was to name them as a member. Yes, I do. And I and I so do. So, so Robert uh, responded. So Simon has faced calls for him to resign from senior female figures in the public life, including Jill Rutiger, now with the think tank British British Future and Hannah White, director of the think tank uh, for the Institute of for Government. The cabinet secretary decided to resign after being in contact with the club's management to clarify a number of points about the vote on memberships. Other members are believed to be in similar correspondence. Britain's security and intelligence service MI6, MI5 and GCHQ, as well as military, have long run campaigns on gender and ethnic diversity. So Richard pledged to end the to end all male shortlists uh, for the appointment of his successor. The MI5, the security service, had two female directors generals in its 113-year history: Stella Rivington in 1992, followed by Elizabeth Mannington Buller in 2002. Ms. Rivington was the first security service chief to be officially identified after her photograph was published in the Independent and the New Statesman. 
MI6, the secret intelligence service, has never had a female chief in its equally long history. Sir Richard, known only as C in the service, who has been in this position since 2020, said last year, I will help forge women equality by working to ensure I'm the last C selected from an all-male shortlist. All three of these director generals, including the director of strategy, the heads of overseas operations, the head of technology known as Q, after a female counterpart in James Bond films and books, and now female. Yes, so if you know your James Bond films, you will know the references there, obviously. But um, going back to the more serious issue here on the Carrot Club, um, uh, like I said, I just um, like whether they have di like it, it's great if they finally change over and they include female uh, people, but I still don't like the fact of the members that they have. I just think it's wrong. I think it's dangerous, and and I just don't approve of it. That's just my personal opinion. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it's just it just feels like to me like it just doesn't feel feel comfortable. It doesn't sit right with me at all, guys. It really, really does not. <clears throat> so this next one here we've got it's not so much an article but more of a, a more of a piece a bit more into the insight of the green party name one of their uh leaders here this one is from open democracy and it's uh shingberry here and so i wish the greens had been able to deal with the transphobia sooner so the candidate to replace the brighton mp caroline lucas is planning for a greek uh, for a green future but is her party united so uh we're talking this article is pretty much about the green party <clears throat> And as you guys know, I'm quite a strong advocate of the Green Party. And uh, understandably, there has been a lot of transphobic issues within the Green Party, which is one of the, which is one thing that has been highlighted by the mainstream media. They don't highlight any of the positives for it, but they will highlight any negatives because that's what they'll do. Uh, shame they can't seem to do that enough with reform, you know. And, you know, they, they always seem to do it with the Greens, but they, they won't give them big enough enough platforms. Just going to throw that in there because I think that's important. Um <clears throat> Despite these issues that they have, um, and despite <coughs> there is a little, there is no doubt there is a bit of division within the Green Party. But one thing I do believe that they want is they do want a better future for Britain and in particular for England. And I really do think that um, the Greens are our best place to do that. Are they a perfect party? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No political party in England is, per is, is, is not perfect, but they, for me, have the best chance of actually giving the fundamental changes here in England that, that people want, that people need. And there's a reason why over the last several years they have been uh, gaining lots and lots of council seats and there have been lots of talks from the grounds up, from the root works that they have been doing and, and long may that continue. Um, I generally believe that they are a, not, a much better alternative than what Lib Dems or what Labour have to offer in my opinion. Now, obviously, one of the biggest arguments that people will, will shout about and the comments will say that voting green will not make a difference at the general election. I can understand that if you want to tactically vote out um, the Conservatives, you're entirely entitled to do that. I'm, I'm in a position where I, in my constituency, is a Labour stronghold. So my vote's not going to really make a massive difference, unfortunately, in the outcome of the general election. So I intend to vote green either way, regardless of, regardless. However, just because it uh, doesn't mean to say that you you have to, at the end of the day, decide what you want to do with your vote. Now, if you want to cast it green because you, you're not happy with Conservatives or Labour and you're not sure about Labour, that's entirely your choice. If you want the Conservatives out more than anything yet, then you make sure you check in your you check uh, you check thoroughly where you're going to be putting your tactical voting for, for whether it's for a Labour candidate or a Lib Dem candidate in your area. You make sure you check thoroughly. Uh, don't just check. Uh, there's, there's certain websites that are the more reliable than others when it comes to tactical voting. StopTheTories.org, I believe, is the, one of the most reliable ones. Um, but in my position, where I am, and because of our, our, our electoral system, I plan on to vote, vote in green. And obviously, if you're from Scotland, uh, in your best interest, you're better off voting for the SNP. Uh, I don't see a vote for Scottish Labour are really going to make a difference up there, in my opinion, or even Conservatives for that matter. Um, however, some people, it, it, there is indications, I have seen a few indications that there may be some votes going towards uh, Scottish Labour. Maybe it's because they want to give them the best chance of, of ousting the Conservatives, maybe. But um, I think you should s stick with uh, stick with the this, this, the SNP in my opinion but I'm an Englishman so it's not really my place to say but that's just my opinion and you can just 
decide, choose whether to take that or not. Obviously, in Wales, uh, obviously, I would say I would encourage people to vote Labour because Labour, um, I can understand some people are fed up with Labour and want something different. There are other other Welsh parties there. And obviously, um, for those in Northern Ireland, I can't really speak, speak. I don't know enough about Northern Irish politics, so that's not something really it's my place to speak of. <clears throat> But let's uh, read into what Shinberry has had to uh, has to say here about the Green Party, and about a bit about her. So the first thing I noticed when I met uh, Shinberry is the whiteboard written across it in a different colour pen are numbers, various calculations of a la beautiful mind. The complicated maths dominated one side of the small office room. It's an insight into how the former uh, former co-leader of the UK Green Party does politics. We were the only ones who were paying attention when Sadiq Khan published his draft budget said Berry, who had spotted that the mayor of London was planning to freeze fares. But he hadn't announced it. We paid attention for everything the mayor does. We look for gaps, we look for opportunities, and we look very closely at the number. The at This attention to detail is what Berry hopes that she can take from her local government role on the London Assembly into Westminster. The long-standing campaigner was selected last year with 71% of first preferable votes to stand for Brighton Pavilion after MP Caroline Lucas announced she was stepping down. This was the only seat the Greens have ever held in the House of Commons, and if Barry were to win the seat, as she is expected to do, she will help usher a new era for the party. It's incredibly exciting, she tells me, from City Hall in East London. I'm not pleased that Caroline is, le is leaving, but I'm also pleased that she has had the faith in to ask me to do it because it is such an important job. It's been a long time coming for Berry. She joined the Greens in 2001. She's been there for a long time, 2001. So more than 20 years there. And first stood for election in 2002, but it wasn't until 2014 that she was elected as a councillor in Camden, North London. It was a position she held for almost 10 years until stepping down in October to focus on Brighton. Alongside that, in 2016, Berry was also elected to the Assembly, the body tasked with scrutinising the Mayor of London, where she has campaigned to increase funding for youth services and, of course, studied the numbers. If she does enter the world of national politics, she will likely be doing so in a Parliament that looks very different than what it does today. The Conservatives are currently heading for a wipeout, polling around 20 points behind Labour, and they have been doing, uh, doing steadily uh, since Liz Trust's disastrous mini-budget. The Conservatives have completely given up, said Barry. Really, uh, they've abandoned all credibility and they're just uh, fling, uh, ideas, flinging ideas out. The current state of the Tory party remains, reminds her of Boris Johnson's behaviour while a London Mayor coming up with wacky, expensive ideas and now infamous and scuppered Garden Bridge. Like, I had a bright idea in a cab on my way here and now I'm going to announce it. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what Boris Johnson really is. Not really planning things up. Like, let's do a garden bridge. Yeah, yeah, let's do a garden bridge. He was a bit of a he was a bit all over the place, Boris. Yeah, uh, among other things as well. The Green Party, which stands on a platform of social, physical policy, left wing social ideas, and of course a strong climate change agenda, has been polling steadily at around seven percent. And it's the climate policies in particular that are res resonating amid a, res a relentless stream of frightening statistics about global warming. North of 20 million people a year are being displaced because of climate change, and it's getting worse. The world has seen its first full year in which average global temperatures tipped to over 1.5 degrees Celsius, limit uh, set by the Paris Agreement in 2015. Meanwhile, the government is ploughing ahead of with new oil and gas licences and basing policy around the plight of car owners rather than the lifespan of the planet. None of the other parties are making it the priority, and it should be, says Berry. This is despite the fact that all temporary charts for the world uh, air temperatures, uh, sea temperatures are particularly terrifying. They're literally off the charts. She adds, we've gone over... 1.5 degrees Celsius, which we knew was a tilting point for the whole year, we could be in a situation of genuine climate crisis much sooner than we thought. It's not just the government who Barry sees as, an, as failing on climate policies. We spent a few weeks after Labour scrapped its £28 billion green investment pledge. Much to the anger of climate campaigners, the need for green MPs to be in Westminster is so clear, she says. It's one of the issues coming up on the doorstep, Barry said. She has been spending all of her time outside of City Hall down in Brighton getting a feel for the issues in a seaside town. As well as the climate, there are other key concerns that people want to talk about, access to healthcare, cuts and youth services, and inevitably housing. 
You can't knock on a renter's door without them bringing up the cost of rent, she said. There are so many people. When you knock on the doors of people who are living in social housing, damp and mould is being put in front of my literal eyes. There is a crisis in Brighton and the conditions of social housing, just as there is in every part of the country, as well as overcrowding, access to council homes, just as it is everywhere. Do landlords have too much power? Yes, says Barry, without missing a beat. Without rental controls, without the power to demand standards and legal compliances from your landlord, and with Section 21 no fault evictions still on the books, you don't have any real fight that gives you, you that gives your landlords more power, more or less of all the power. There are other solutions. We should be bringing more houses, but we should be building more council homes and social housing by a massive, massive preference, and that is not what's going on at the moment. Still thinking of, uh, still tempted to vote green at all, maybe, guys? I am tempted to do a policy watch on them, on the Green Party at some point. What's that? Oh, time will tell, guys, time will tell. In 2021, Barry stepped down as co-chair of the Greens, explaining in an open democracy piece at the time that a trans-inclusive view beliefs were not compatible with the party's decision to hire a spokesperson who did not share those views. Dax Pug's person, Shahia Ali, was later fired from the role. Ali took the Green Party to court over the decision, argued that he had been dismissed because of his gender-critical views. A protected belief under the Equality Act, as part of his case, he accused Berry of discrimination, quoting an open democracy interview. A court judgment in February found proper procedure had not been followed uh, during uh, Ali's dismissal and awarded him 9,100 in damages. Crucially, however, the court acknowledged the right of the party to dismiss a spokesperson if they do not support the position, if they do not support the position of the party. So how does Barry feel, B Barry, sorry, Barry feel about the judgment? I find it interesting because it, it did uh, to some extent say I was correct, she said. It is also a vindication of her decision to step down at the time. Ali had demonstrated repeatedly that he did not agree with our policy that was positive towards trans people. And that was severely antagonistic towards the members who wanted to make sure that the party stood by its values, Barry said. The case symbolising the internal battle the Green Party is having over some of its positions on trans rights. It is a trans-inclusive party, but some members don't believe it should be. Is it still struggling with this problem? So what... So why do some Green members have a problem with trans-inclusive in the party? Hmm? What's their issue with it? Answers on a postcard, please. It is still an ongoing issue, says Berry. I wish I'd been able to deal with transphobia sooner. We weren't able to keep it from being quite a big part and of quite a big part and a lot of Green Party spaces. They made a lot of people really upset and it was unfair and discriminatingly towards our trans and non-binary members. Does UK politics have a transphobia pro problem? Barry agrees when asked if the Conservatives have shown themselves to be transphobic. That says things are a little less clear with Labour. These are people at all levels in the Labour Party who are speaking more in a more intolerant and transphobic way, and the Labour Party is, is not choosing to deal with that. At this point, Barry stresses that she did not want transphobia to dominate the interview, telling me publicly and privately that it had taken a lot of energy. Indeed, the court documents showed the issues raised in Berry's 2021 Open Democracy interview were later also subject to internal complaints, in which Berry had been cleared of. Not that she wanted sympathy, she was instead keen for people to focus on the difficulties these groups face. Transphobia in the UK is dominant in the media and politics, amplified by small groups of loud voices. There are consequences to stoking hatred. Last year, in February 2023, trans schoolgirl Brianna Gray was murdered by two schoolmates in a park. So Barry George online under this topic. It's not a subject I thought when I came into this job that I would need this much debate. It seems so obvious that we're moving in the right direction and I thought that people in all kinds of differences would have more rights in the future and we'd be pleased about it. No, that's clearly not the case. And and I've and uh, and I said this in my um I said this in my video that um that's uh, with regards to list trust bill about uh, about transphobia and and obviously I disagree with Liz Trust Bill and it got blocked and it basically got filibustered in the Commons. Is that while I disagreed with it, obviously I still think it should have had a right to debate. But I, this is the, the point I want to make is obviously is that whether you're trans, whether you're non-binary, whatever, whatever, you, whatever your sex is or non-sex, um, everyone should have their space whatsoever. And... 
everybody should be treated equally. That's it. That There's no two ways about this. But we still have these conversations. We're still having these issues. And we still have trans people trying to fight for better rights. We still have black people continuously having themselves racist, uh, made racist remarks and whatnot because of the colour of their skin. We're still having Muslims being treated indifferently because of events that take place outside of this country. We still have Jews who are chastised and chased and uh, because of what's happening in Gaza. We're still having these issues of um, racism and, and derogatory and transphobic and, and all these terrible hatreds that are still taking place. And I go by the very principle that I've, I've come to learn in from my own personal experiences in life is that treat everyone equally. Just try and try, well, at least try to treat everyone equally as possibly as they can. And if they're a jerk to you, then you be a jerk back to them. It's as simple as that. Like, don't judge people by their religion, by their nationality, by the colour of their skin. Judge them on how they treat you and how you would want to treat them. And if it's equally, then there wouldn't be any issues. Well, unfortunately, we don't live in that society, but that's the best advice I could give to anyone listening to this. <coughs> so Barry is under no illusions that the Greens are anywhere near a majority in Westminster, but says the party's ambition is to make it clear it may play a similar role in the Commons as it does in the Lond Greater London Authority, where she is one of three Green London Assembly members. In the current system, she says, we're looking to become the most influential opposition party. It's like we are in this building. At the time when politics seemed, seemed so bleak, mired in scandal, politics that often crumble in support the most vulnerable alongside tax breaks for the wealthy, Greens come with a more radical message of hope. It's one arguably that the party can hold with little exception of achieving real power. Or could it? I asked Barry whether we might see a Green government in my lifetime. I would love to see a Green government in my lifetime. But that simply comes down to whether or not we will ever get proportional representation. I truly believe there is a progressive majority in this country that if we have proportional representation, we'd have parties broadly left able to form a government, she said. If you look at the ex exceptional growth in our uh, councillors, then who knows? It's a nice piece by Barry. I, I, I like this. Um, obviously, the transphobia issues is... I can understand, obviously, the, the uh, obviously it, it is a difficult issue and a sensitive issue, understandably so. And I think that's, <clears throat> and at least they are, you're not hiding away from this issue. Um, you know, w you know that there have been issues within the Conservatives, especially around racism, and there have been issues in the past around anti-Semitism in Labour. There may still be some in, in Labour that we don't know about. But it's better to be clear about these things and try to draw a line under them uh, as as well. But <clears throat> I still have uh, faith in the Green Party, um, despite these despite these issues. I really do, um, simply because of the policies and what they say, and they are very clear on them. And I really recommend if you want to look them out themselves, like they've got hundreds and thousands of policies on their website at the Green Party. Um, it's really really uh, fascinating to to basically go through and. Um, and I, and I generally, am, one day, I do hope to actually just sit with a video with you guys and share some of them with you. So, guys, got one more video to uh, one more video, guys, from Byline Times. <coughs> uh, this one is about reform. Um, interesting one, to say the least. So, the reform parliamentary candidate who shared races. Uh, consent resigns after questions by Byline Times. Nick Davis shared a post featuring the London Mayor Sadiq Khan and Adolf Hitler. Um, I don't know if they're going to share a show. I can't remember if in the article if there's a picture of the t of them two together. But basically, there was a tweet by the candidate that basically had a picture of Sadiq Khan and um, Adolf Hitler, basically claiming that they're both the same person. Yeah, you try and figure that out. Explain to me how they're the same person. Hmm. <clears throat> and, um, and by the way, there's a lot of questionable candidates within reform. A lot of them. They are planning, and Richard Tice has said that he is planning at the general election to have a candidate in every single seat um, as well. So, And they've obviously been having talks with um, the TUV in Northern Ireland. They've had those uh, meeting or some kind of agreement with them. I don't know too much about that, so I'll let... Um, Max, any any news regarding that? I'll let Max cover it for for you guys. But um, 
Um, but, uh, I, you know, a lot of these candidates, if you literally, it's not that hard. If you have a reform candidate in your constituency, it's not that hard to literally go through their Twitter and then you can find a lot of lot of things about them and literally just, you know, just it speaks about volumes about the kind of people that they have within their party. A lot of it's just could not be more anti-British, anti-British. A lot of candidates and things have said, um, yeah, not looking forward to just talking about this one, if I'm honest, guys. But let's go over in this last one. So Reform UK's recent gains in its first MP, former Conservative Deputy Chair Lee Anderson, who defected to the party after claiming that London Mayor Sadiq Khan had handled the city to Islamics. Not true. Nonsense. Anyone who believes this is a dummy. Let's not just go there, guys. It's just not, not true. There's no evidence to support this. Okay, there's just not. Okay. Byline Times can reveal that several reform prospective parliamentary candidates, PPCs, have shared content on their social media accounts that is radicalised, denies the existence of climate change or promotes, conspira or promotes conspiracy theories. While the investigation the party reform confirms to Byline Times that the North Bedfordshire PPC Nick Davis has resigned as a candidate after we spoke to him about the content on his social media. Oh, what a shame. On March the 4th, Davis shared a post in which he featured the text, Evil doesn't die, it reinvents itself. Over a picture of Sadiq Khan and Adolf Hitler, Davis also shared posts in September and October calling on immigrants and invasion and a silent army housed in hotels. No, it's just, just, just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And the worst thing is, yeah, it's because it's a Facebook post, 48 likes there. What's wrong with people? <clears throat> In a statement to this newspaper, the party said Reform UK makes the distinction between malice and irreceity in its activities and its supporters. Malice was uh, we taken very seriously. Harmless opinion is not a problem in a party that believes wholeheartedly in freedom of speech, nor should it be in a wider society. The recent tweets of Andrew Hubson, the Reform PPC of North uh, Durham of X, formerly Twitter, included account, account, an account <coughs> claiming that mRNA shots are the most dangerous product ever forced upon the public. And the former Conservative, now M independent MP, uh, uh, Andrew Britton, claimed that COVID vaccine will be considered the greatest crime against humanity. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Vaccine, COVID vaccine saved lives. Wait, let's be clear about that. He also retweeted a video clip of the US President Joe Biden talking about building regulations in relations to wildfire resilience and claimed that he had been referencing the roofs of houses that survived wildfire, wildfires as an evidence of use of direct energy weapons to cause wildfires in Texas and Brazil. Okay. The ideology of the freedom movement and the post-lockdown outgrowth of the anti-lockdown movement that poets its reduction in living standards are orchestrated by the World Economic Forum as part of the Great Reset, also appeared in material shared by several reform candidates. Yeah, they're um, nuts, basically. The WF is the annual gathering of politicians and the corporate executive class at Davos, which became the subject of conspiracy theories during the pandemic. And Maggie Moderito, the reformed PPC for Bedford, retweeted a post from Wide Awake Media and Conspiracy Platform, which claimed that globalists are using the man-made climate change lie as pretext to deliberately collapse the food supply so people will have no choice but to eat insects and grow lab meat. Yeah, apparently that's, that's where we're going. Um, by the way, um, what's wrong with lab-grown meat? If it tastes like lamb, if it tastes like meat, and it's it's the same and the same feeling as normal meat, what's 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 the issue? Like let's let's just that on that on that that thing there about lab grown meat. By the way, if you were having a chicken burger, um, and then you had another chicken burger, but this, and it was the exact tasty exact same, but the only difference is it wasn't coming from a chicken; it was it was grown out of a lab. Would that bother you? Answers on a postcard below. She also retweeted a post from the same account claiming that broadcaster Neil Oliver equiloquilicans summarises the global pushback against global tyranny in relation to a speech in which he claimed that there was a coordinated global conspiracy seeking domination of the world by a handful of ideologists, hell bent on a return to feudalism. Again, nonsense, guys. Just, just silly stuff. 
David Holland, the reformed PPC for mid Bedfordshire, wrote on his blog that Bill Gates and the WF want to reduce the population via the medium of vaccines. The blog described the movement towards a dystopian future of lockdown, spiraling inequality and restrictions on civil liberties and attributed the driving force behind though these outcomes to a coordinating effort between governments and corporations to create a new world order overseen by the WEF. The Reform Party's manifesto rejects the influence of the World Economic Forum and contains a pledge to hold a public inquiry into vaccine harms and excessive deaths. Several Reform PPCs were previously Conservative Party councillors or PPCs. Dr. Annie Kelly, a post-doctoral researcher on conspiracy theories and correspondent for the podcast QAnon Anonymous, told Byline Times that although the Tory party has been quite good at message discipline and keeping that stuff under the rats for the time being, I can see a weakened Conservative party not in power being much more maligned to forces like reform. Dr. Kelly said that these conspiracy theories is a kind of prom- prom- promoted by some reformed PPCs, often take legitimate issues and point to people who is responsible towards much more shadowy and nefarious enemies who can never be defeated. She said that the ideology of the freedom movement has broadened out beyond COVID in a denial into general denialism. There, another theme across the pond of several reformed PPCs was the denial of the existence of climate change. <sighs> Several reform PPCs have regularly referred to the climate hoax and shared content denying a link between human industrial activity and carbon emissions as well as attacking American Scientologist Michael Mayne and the hockey stick graph, which shows a rapid increase in global temperatures since the Industrial Revolution. Wow. Nuts. These are, these are crazy people, guys. And remember, these are these are what some of the reform candidates think of. On March the 6th, uh, Maggie Morinto posted on X that we are being fed BS on the climate hoax. We will be forced uh, fed a diet of man-made meat while in elites enjoy the real thing. Uh, a repost of tweets attacked by a hockey stick graph with it as junk science. I don't know. I'm lost on that one. Uh, Reform PPC for Stockton North, uh, John McDonaldry, shared posts on his Facebook page referring to the climate hoax as calling people who believe in climate change as being part of a cult. Apparently we're part of a cult because we, we want to protect the planet. He also wrote on a post claiming that the Earth's temperature began to rise before the CO, before increases in CO2, which he, arguably debunks, which he argues debunks climate models. And your evidence is... Uh, your evidence is, uh, John, As a, are you a scientist? Do you have evidence to back up these claims? Uh, any at all? Oh, no, no? Oh, okay, okay. So we just, we'll just, we just believe you and not, and not all the scientists who have been saying these things for, for decades then, yeah? Okay, okay, sure. Reformed PPC for Derby, Tim Professor, also shared videos denying climate science, including my former Fox who knows... Tucker Carlson, ah, Putin's poodle. The International Panel on Climate Change calls for 48% reduction in emissions by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2050. A target that some scientists, such as the Climate Change Advisory Group, said is too little too late. The Reform Party denies that climate change can be averted by reducing emissions and argues that net zero is damaging our livelihoods and our economy. Bob Ward, Policy and Communication Director at LSE's Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment told Byline Times that the material on the Reform UK website is a demonstrably false. Right. <clears throat> and that not just result of incompetence, it's disinformation, it's deliberate misinformation about climate impacts. He added that since the by- Uxbridge by-election media, British media, particularly the Telegraph, Mail and Sun Tiles, have done some extent the times have all started championing misinformation about climate policy. They largely have gone down the route of promoting uh, outright denial of the physics of climate change, but behind their claims is an implicit denial of the risks of climate change. You can only say that delaying net zero is a desirable option if you don't accept the scientist's assessment of the scale of the problem. Yeah, so this is the premise, yeah. They're basically saying, let's stop listening to the experts. So when 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 you take your car to a car mechanic, yeah, you you can't listen to him because we don't listen to experts anymore. 
no, you're gonna take you're gonna take your car to the dentist, yeah, because you don't trust experts. You're gonna to speak to some. You're gonna try this person instead. Because why would you want to listen to experts? You know. Oh, you want your teeth salted? No, well, why don't you go and see a veterinarian instead? You know, because you know you can't listen to experts anymore. Let's just do that instead. These are experts, scientists, the best knowledge about our planet and the conditions that it runs in. Please wake the hell up about this, please. Wall said that this allowed those with even more wacky views on climate to rear their heads again and start making ridiculous claims about science. Well, that's going to hurt my monetization talking about that article. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to get full modernization uh, from this uh, video because of that. Thanks, Byline Times. Yeah, I wasn't expecting to, I wasn't expecting uh, too much of that, but uh, shows what I know. But um, I think it's important, yeah, you know, to hear what some of the reform candidates, uh, potential candidates, and people within the Re reform party are saying, and what they generally believe in. If which is a lot of crazy, crazy stuff. It really is, guys. Climate change is issue. It's real and it's an issue and it needs to be dealt with. As far as the COVID vaccine goes, um, COVID vaccines helped and it was statistically proven to have reduced the numbers uh, in, here in the UK and around the world. Did some uh, vaccines potentially cause the death of people? That is entirely possible. It's entirely possible. But overall, it made a, uh, the vaccines made a difference to people's lives. The vast majority. Um, Overall, people are better off because they took it, and that that that's generally true. Maybe, like I don't, uh, as far as I'm aware, I don't have a microchip in me since I had my vaccines. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you guys still think that I've got a uh, microchip in me somewhere from from the vaccine that potentially might be people following me. But uh, I. There are some policies that reform has, which which um, I do like, but the vast majority of things they they want more austerity. By the way, according to, if you go to their website, their policy states they actually want more austerity as well. So I, I wouldn't take uh, reform and take their candidates seriously. I can understand if you're a conservative voter and you don't want to vote conservative anymore because of the state of things are. Vote green. Vote for something new. Vote for change. Vote for the better. And guys. Uh, we have reached the end of Regan's news round. Guys, what did you make of some of the stories that we covered today? We covered quite a few variety of stories here. One hour and 22 minutes we have gone here today. What did you guys think of all the stories going from the Rwanda bill to the BBC, rent prices, post office scandal, the, the Garrett Club, the Green Party, and finally reform there let me know your thoughts about all these stories in the comments section down below but just before you go if you haven't already please hit the like button we greatly appreciate share this across social media so others are aware of this video and subscribe because it really does help support the channel and if you want to go one step further and financially support me in the work i do here you can do so by becoming a youtube member for as little as 99p also i do additional content on both rumble and patreon as well you can check out the links for them in the description you can also find my youtube shorts not just here but also on tiktok and on instagram both the links for them are in the description so feel free to check out my links tree which shows you all my social media so you can connect with me through them as well so thank you all so much for watching and i hope to catch you all very very soon